Welcome to the Invite Health Podcast, where our degreed healthcare professionals are excited to offer you the most important health and wellness information you need to make informed choices about your health. You can learn more about the products discussed in each of these episodes and all that Invite Health has to offer at www.invitehealth.com slash podcast. First time customers can use promo code podcast at checkout for an additional 15% off your first purchase. Let's get started. At this point in time, I think most people feel like they have a minor degree when it comes to virology. We've all heard so much now about the coronavirus and its different variants. And for many people, this maybe was your first introduction. Maybe you've heard of, you know, the common flu. Every season there's, you know, different strains or variants of the influenza virus. And then obviously now we're dealing with the coronavirus and you keep hearing about all of these different variants that are coming out right now. The big concern is with the Delta variant. But I want to talk about another virus that has many different variants and is one of the most common viruses out there and infects the most people and can potentially become incredibly lethal. So today I want to talk about HPV, human papillomavirus, and we certainly know that it is linked with the development of certain cancers. When we think about cervical cancer, for example, or anal cancer, and this is a big issue that is oftentimes kind of swept under the rug. The Kaiser Family Foundation did a a test, basically, where they were assessing how many people actually have HPV or have been infected with HPV, and how many people are even aware of what HPV is. And their findings were quite alarming, which is why I want to talk about today, because I've had many people, usually women, who reach out to me and say, hey, I was told by my doctor that I have HPV, what can I do? And they're usually very worried because we know that HPV can potentially cause cancer. So when we are now in the world of thinking about variants and viruses, I thought this is the perfect time to talk about HPV, human papilloma virus. So I am Amanda Williams, MD, MPH. And what are the facts? What do we know about HPV? Well, we know that the human papilloma virus is the most common sexually transmitted infection in the United States and throughout the world. We know that every single year, Every single year, it's good 25 million active cases and about five and a half million new cases. So when you think about that, that's an awful lot of people who have HPV. So back to the study from the Kaiser Family Foundation, when they said 70% of American adults 18 and older have never even heard of HPV. 70% of Americans over the age of 18 have never even heard of HPV. Although we know that HPV is incredibly common. Just told you the the statistics on this. There are over 100 different variants of HPV. And because of this, certain strains of human papillomavirus are more detrimental to our health than others. 80% of U.S. adults over the age of 18 will become infected with HPV at some point in time in their life. Now, most new infections occur when people are in their teenage years, young adults, more sexually active. But the problem with HPV is that certain strains, since we're thinking strains, remember we all have our minor degree in virology now, since we are talking about strains, certain strains can cause cervical cancer. They can cause cancer of the penis, the anus, in the mouth, in the throat. This virus can cause genital warts. And I just said 80% of people can end up developing this. And you think about those numbers and you say, wow, that's, that's quite a bit of people. Yes. Now, the one thing is, is because our immune systems generally are equipped and we can usually rid our body of this. But that's not always the case. Because remember, it depends on the strain in which we are infected with. So understanding what we should be doing to mitigate any potential exposure to any of these hundred strains of human papillomavirus to avoid 
further problems. Because we think about what are those problems? Well, cancer, the big C word. We look at the different cancers that are associated with HPV infections. And we recognize that cervical cancer is certainly the most common HPV-associated cancer. But we also see, you know, cancers in the back of the throat, cancers in the base of the tongue. We know that HPV is thought to be responsible for more than 90% of anal and cervical cancers. We know that oropharyngeal cancers, which most people used to always say, oh, it's because, you know, you were smoking and you were drinking. Now they think 70% of those cancers are because of HPV. I mean, I know a lot of times people think a virus is just, oh, it's just a cold. There are some scary viruses out there, and human papillomavirus happens to be one of them. Once again, it's, can the immune system fend it off? Maybe, maybe not. Do you want to risk that? This is always the question. Cervical cancer, oral cancers. You have to always have your guard up, which is why I wanted to talk about this today. Because like I said, I've had people reach out to me that are in a panic saying, what do I do? And I understand that that can be very alarming. You know, maybe you go in and a female has a pap smear done. A week or two goes by and your doctor reaches out to you and says, hey, you've got cervical dysplasia, which is the precursor for cervical cancer. You know, maybe they do a watch and wait come back in in six months or a year and redo that pap smear. But oftentimes they go to the next step of doing a procedure. And we know that there are certain things that are definitely linked to a greater likelihood. I mean, obviously practicing safe sex is, you know, first and foremost, because we know that this is the primary transmission. But we also have to look at issues within the way that the body detoxifies. So methylation disorders, which is why they've been able to link folate deficiencies with greater likelihood of the development of cervical dysplasia and then hence cervical cancers. So your B vitamins, so taking methyl B every day would be really wise. Vitamin E, we know that in women who have cervical abnormalities or cervical cancer, that they found that their vitamin E levels were always on the low end. And when they gave them vitamin E supplementation, it actually reversed that cervical dysplasia. We know that EGCG coming from green tea is another thing that's very targeted and has been studied in the setting of cervical dysplasia brought on because of HPV infections. And I know I'm focusing a lot on the cervical dysplasia, but this is said true too. So if there's men out there listening and you have concerns, then you should be doing these same supplements. Vitamin C, And the reason why cervical dysplasia is more well known in that setting with HPV is because usually women are going in and having annual pap smears. So they're more likely to have this caught as opposed to men who are probably not going in and doing these types of screenings. So whenever we have this abnormal growth of cells, this is a problem. And this is why we want to mitigate any of these risk factors. We know that there are other things that can leave you more open to HPV infections. You know, if someone's immunocompromised, they have an autoimmune disease, if you smoke, women who are on birth control pills appear to be at an increased risk for cervical cancers. And why is that? Because they're probably not practicing safe sex because they have their birth control pills. I know that sometimes people don't want to talk about this stuff, but you know what? We don't have to go into to details on this, but we have to understand that 70% of Americans don't even know what HPV is, but yet 80% of Americans over the age of 18 will at some point in time be infected with HPV. And that could potentially lead to a cancer. That's a really big problem. When we know that there are these different things that we can be doing to try to offset this. Now in the International Journal of Gynecologic Cancer, They looked at just the impact of daily multivitamins. And they found that women who had supplemented with things like vitamin A, vitamin C, vitamin E, calcium, had a much lower viral load than those women who did not. So it's not like you still didn't get the infection. They were still infected with HPV, but their viral loads, when they can actually see So the lower viral load, less likely that that virus 
can do more damage. So that was published back in 2010. I mentioned the study where they looked at folate deficiency, and this was published in the Nutrition Research Journal all the way back in 2005, showing that women who have folate deficiency are at a greater risk for developing cervical dysplasia that can then lead to cervical cancer. One of the reasons why women sometimes are not getting adequate amount, and men too, of folate is we're not eating enough green leafy vegetables. So there's a lot of different things that we know are directly linked to HPV infection and the potential for developing a cancer, cervical cancer, cancer in the penis. I mean, these are things that you have to think about. What can you do? I had mentioned methyl B. And why the methyl B? Because it's that activated B vitamin complex that is going to help to support the body's methylation process. And all of these things are important because if we have a methylation disorder, then that is a problem. You know, they have actually started doing DNA methylation testing in the setting of cervical cancers because they realize, oh, wow, this is, this is a problem. Interestingly enough, vitamin D is something that many doctors now are starting to turn towards in this setting for women who have cervical dysplasia, who are maybe more prone to getting different vaginal infections, candida infections. And they found that when they gave them vitamin D in a suppository, that it did a wonderful job in terms of targeting the infection itself. Because remember, vitamin D plays a role with our immune system, but also easing inflammation. Remember, the less inflammation that we have, the less likely things can go haywire. So in the Journal of Dermatoendocrinology back in 2014, this is what they published, chronic cervical infections and dysplasia. And that vaginal vitamin D in a high dose was a very effective method. Finding that the vitamin D was absorbed into the vaginal mucosa the way that it was, led it to be a very promising anti-inflammatory as well as anti-dysplastic agent. So they said that vitamin D shows very good anti-inflammatory effects. Six weeks after this thera therapy in this study, 80% of the women had less vaginal problems, less discharge, less problems with sexual intercourse because it was targeting the inflammation at the same time, helping to support the cellular replication. Because remember, vitamin D plays a role into this. When we think about the way our cells divide, vitamin D is, is critical to this. Another study that was done in the Hormone Cancer Journal just back in 2017, looking at the effects of long-term vitamin D supplementation on metabolic status of cervical cancer. And this was a randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trial. So they said that they weren't aware of any study that was looking at the long-term effect of vitamin D administration. This is supplemental, so taking it orally on cervical dysplasia. And they found that when they gave women vitamin D for six months, it resulted in regression. So when they went back in and did another pap smear, they're like, oh, wow, we have, this looks better than the last one. Because why? Vitamin D is helping to support healthier cellular change. And the other thing that they noticed was that it was helping to support insulin. What do we know about cancers? What do we know about improper cell growth? They like sugar. So if we have insulin resistance, that's a problem. They found that when they gave the women the vitamin D for six months, all of a sudden they are having much better glucose and insulin levels. They were giving them 50,000 IUs for six months. So 50,000 IUs every other week. So that's not a lot of vitamin D when you think about that. 50,000 IUs every two weeks. So let me just do the math here real quick on that. So we're going to do our 50,000 IUs. We're going to divide that by the 14. So we're looking at 3,500 IUs per day. I myself take 5,000 IUs a day. And just 
doing that. 3,500 IUs of vitamin D every day for six months. And they had a significant change in not only their blood glucose and insulin levels, but they had improvement in the cell on the cervix. That's just why we have to be aware of these things. I mean, understanding that just basic vitamins, folate, vitamin D, play such an integral role into maintaining our health. You know, obviously when you're dealing with something such as HPV, which can lead to something like cervical dysplasia, we always have to think about our diet too. It, consuming high antioxidant foods, green tea, white tea, black tea. So taking green tea TX, for example, two full droppers of that into water every day, along with the core multivitamin or the women's multivitamin or the men's multivitamin, so that you're getting all of those different vitamins and micronutrients and those powerful antioxidants, adherence to a Mediterranean diet. All of this makes a huge, huge difference. So we know that they've done studies where they said, okay, women who have cervical dysplasia and cervical cancer have lower vitamin E. Give them vitamin E, they get improvement. We see the studies where they say, okay, these women have low vitamin D, we give them vitamin D, they have improvement. We see the studies where they, these women have low folate, we give them folate, they have improvement. I mean, this isn't difficult to adhere to. And because I've had so many women reach out to me in regards to, to this, and it's usually like, is there a particular you know, protocol for me to follow? Are there certain nutrients that I should be including into my daily routine? And I always you know, come up with just kind of a standard protocol. So I'll kind of just go through it quickly with you here. But it's methyl B, taking one capsule a day. Indole 3 carbonyl with DIM. So those are your cruciferous vegetables. Because remember, we know that there's power within those vegetables and the constituents that come from that. So two caps of that per day. Vitamin D, 3,000 IUs daily. Just told you about the study showing the impact of vitamin D. Zinc, because we know zinc is very important when we think about wound healing and maintaining our immune system. So if we have an infection such as HPV, we want to be able to bolster up our immune defenses. So 30 milligrams of zinc every day. Now, we want to think immune system once again, so we want to be able to stabilize our microbiome. So probiotic HX, one capsule of probiotic HX every day. We're taking our multivitamin, either the core multi or the women's multi, the men's multivitamin, every day, but it would also be advantageous to throw in some extra antioxidants and go with vitamin C, 2,000 milligrams, in addition to what you're getting from the multivitamin. Taking the natural vitamin E, so we're helping to support our antioxidant defenses once again, and then the green tea. And whether we're using the green tea capsules, such as the green tea HX, or you're using the green tea TX, the liquid, but however we look at it, we know that there are all of these different nutrients that can help to support and stabilize our immune system, support the way that cells are dividing. And when we have 80% of the population who at some point in time will be infected, we want to make sure that our immune system is always at the ready. So certainly if you do happen to have questions on any of this, you know, reach out to one of our healthcare experts at any of our store locations. If you're not exactly sure as to, you know, the timing of the day when you should be taking all these different nutrients, certainly ask them and they will be able to give you some guidance. But I just thought it was fitting to, to talk about um, HPV today since there are over 100 different variants of this. And the more that we know about what we can do to fend things off, the better off that we are. So thank you so much for tuning in to the Invite Health Podcast. Remember, you can find all of our episodes for free wherever you listen to podcasts or by visiting invitehealth.com slash podcast. Now do make sure that you subscribe and you leave us a review. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Invite Health. And we will see you next time for another episode of the Invite Health Podcast. 